Let's have a look at the highlights of our module 205D, Cranking System Control Circuits. In this module, the objectives are we need to be able to explain the operation of a cranking motor control circuit. So what controls a cranking motor? To do that, we need to be able to interpret a system circuit diagram. We need to know how the operation of a cranking motor solenoid actually works. And lastly, the operation of a magnetic switch. So keeping our starting system schematic simple, we just need a power source and a load. In this case, we have a battery and the load is our starter motor. Then we need two wires. We need a positive wire and a negative wire to get the amperage from the battery to the load and back to the battery. Right here, the positive wire is hooked to the motor terminal and the negative wire is hooked to the ground terminal of the motor. So this starter motor will be turning. With our engine, we need to be able to turn the starting motor on and off. So that means we're going to have to put a switch in. And if we measure the amperage on our starting motor, when it's cranking the engine, it would be hundreds, if not thousands of amps. So the size of the switch to run a thousand amp through would be huge. So we're going to have to do something different. And if you notice on this system, as well as any other real system, there is no fuses in these wires and there are no switches. They're just hooked directly from the battery to the starting motor. So we're going to need a really heavy duty switch. The other thing we're going to need is when the starting motor is engaged and the engine is cranking, it'll crank at about 250 RPM. But when the engine's idling, it will be much higher than that. And then, of course, the engine's going to rev up faster than that, which is going to overspeed the cranking motor. So we need to have some way of engaging the cranking motor to the engine and then as well as disengaging when we don't need it. So we need to engage the cranking motor and disengage as well as turn the motor on and off. So that's going to be the job of our cranking motor solenoid. So there's a picture of our starting motor and on top of the starting motor is the solenoid. We call it a cranking motor solenoid, but in real life, it's actually performing two operations. It is a solenoid as well as a magnetic switch. The definition of a solenoid is we use magnetic force to create linear motion. If I send power to this solenoid, it's going to create a magnetic field around the coil of wire in the solenoid. The armature is going to want to center itself in the magnetic field so it's going to pull in. The same thing happens with our starting solenoid. If I send power to the coil of wire, it'll create a magnetic field pulling the armature into the center of the magnetic field. This is going to pivot the shift fork causing the pinion to push out and that is how the starting motor engages and disengages from the engine or hooks to and unhooks from the engine when we need it. The other thing that happens is the armature pushes on a pin which then closes the contacts on a electrical switch. So that is the definition of a magnetic switch. Creating a magnetic field to close or open contacts in a switch. So let's move our power wire from the motor to the starter solenoid. So we have hooked the power wire to this contact. And we can see that contact doesn't go anywhere unless the switch closes. So now we need a something to get power to the coils of wire in the starter solenoid. And we need to be able to turn it on and off. So let's put in a switch. And we're going to need a wire to hook the switch to the starter solenoid right there. Now when we send power to the solenoid using the key it is going to create a magnetic field in the pull-in and hold-in windings that is going to cause the armature to want to center in that magnetic field. 
it is going to engage the starter with the flywheel ring gear. So now the starter is hooked to the engine. After the pinion is engaged in the starter, the contact disc will then move into position, closing or making contact with the heavy terminals on the starter solenoid, allowing power to move through that contact into the starter motor, causing it to spin. With this, we can get a little fancier. We could put in a clutch disconnect switch or maybe a neutral safety switch. We could possibly put in a pressure switch hooked to the engine oil. So if we have engine oil pressure, the starter can't operate. This wire may be running all over the cab into the engine bay, down to the starter. We may want to be able to put a fuse in there so we can have a fuse in that system. Now our control circuit is only running the amperage required to fire or engage the pull-in and hold-in windings of the starter solenoid. If we measured those two windings, it would probably be somewhere between 50 and 100 amps. So now we have a circuit that's only flowing 50 or 100 amps controlling a circuit that has hundreds, possibly thousands of amps flowing through it. Many starter control circuits are set up this way. In more modern equipment, where we may want to have smaller wires and smaller switches just simply because we don't have enough room, we could do something like this. We put a relay or a magnetic switch which are the same thing, into the circuit. So now my control circuit is only firing or only carrying the amperage for the little coil of wire that's in the relay or the coil of wire that's in the magnetic switch. So instead of having to hold the 50 or 100 amps required to fire the starter solenoid, it could be the 0.1 or 3 amps to fire the relay or the magnetic switch. So our wires and switches could be a lot smaller and a lot cheaper. And we can run the magnetic switch or relay close to the starter and have much bigger wires running to it. So there's a magnetic switch using magnetic force to close contacts in a switch. Relays and mag switches are the same thing. We normally reserve the term magnetic switch for something a little more robust or can carry more amperage than your average relay. So now let's have a look at a real wiring schematic. So in this section we want to make sure we can interpret a schematic which we've kind of already done with the simple drawings that we did. Here I just wanted to show you a real schematic and uh, give you a little bit of insight into it in case you haven't used a schematic very much. Now this is a Caterpillar interactive schematic. Cat came up with these a few years ago. Schematics are more or less interactive depending on the type of machine and how new it is. So we picked the one for the Cat 287B. It's a track skid steer. Uh, Cat calls it a multi-terrain loader. This page here is just a how to use it page. Each manufacturer, if they have these, will have something different. So we're not going to worry too much about that. Generally, your schematics on the front page of them will have what they're good for. So this schematic pertains to all of these skid steer loaders and multi-terrain loaders. And the one we wanted to look at was a 287B. You may want to come down and look at somewhere in there what serial number and here our 287B is right here with ZSA 1 and up. So if your serial number doesn't fall into that, of course, you're probably going to want to find the proper schematic. Nice thing about CAT's uh, schematic is they have these schematic locations and machine locations. And then these are just the name of all the components. We'll come back and have a closer look at that. This is the same thing, but in the cab. So this schematic actually has two schematics in it. Same idea showing you with a schematic location and machine location for all of the electrical connectors.
little bit of wiring information we won't worry too much about a little bit of specs wire descriptions some people like to have wire descriptions and what the wire number is and what the color cat's kind of nice and oops oh, sorry that they give you uh, a couple pages of that some symbols uh, each manufacturer is a good thing to talk about there's ISO symbols which is what our ILM is mostly based off of it's great not all manufacturers follow them some manufacturers draw their own symbols for things but generally just by looking at them you can figure out pretty much what they're for and that's what we're mainly going to do here today so this is the first of the two schematics there's a lot of wires and a lot of components here they're impossible to read we'll zoom in on them a bit and have a quick look and kind of go through some of the components this is a second schematic showing the cab and uh, auxiliary functions of the machine and then our machine locations so this one's all hyperlinked so if I pick let's say machine location 2 I can come down to what is at machine location 2 and it can take me to the schematic okay so what I'm going to do for now is we're just going to go up to our engine and chassis component location. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can read it. And here's all the components that they're giving you to look at. Lots of solenoids. Let's go, for example, since we're in the starter section, let's go see if we can find the starter. So CAT kind of names everything a little bit backwards. The um, name it would be, it's a starting motor. So they call it a motor. So they'll name all of the motors. So we got motor starter A, motor starter B, motor water pump. So that's all this down here. So we got starter motor A and B. Now that means there could be two starter motors on this thing, but Generally, skid steers aren't big enough to have two starter motors. So if I come down to the bottom, we got A is good for these machines, B is good for these. And our 287 we were going to look at is in the B. So let's go to starter motor B. Its schematic location is G12, so it's just like reading a map. Machine location is 50. So I'm just going to click on the 50 and it shows my starter motor is just above the rear wheel and looks like it's on the left hand side of the machine so somewhere near the engine sounds good to me i clicked on the location and it took me right here to the starter motor so it doesn't matter how this machine is set up the biggest thing we need to do here is be able to interpret a schematic so i'm going to go through a few of the symbols and We'll talk about them. So let's start with the starter motor. The motor, on top of the starter motor, there is our start solenoid. I'll zoom in slightly. The S terminal comes in. We can see the one winding which is hooked to ground. So which winding is hooked through the solenoid directly to ground? That's right, that's your hold-in winding. So the one that comes through and hooks to the motor terminal, there is my pull-in winding. There is the contact discs. So when those two solenoids engage, this contact will come up and make continuity and the motor will turn. Battery, so it's got one single battery, negative positive post. Here, is a symbol for a breaker. It's a 30 amp breaker. The single fuse like this, it doesn't tell me if it's a type one, type two, or type three by this picture because they are not following the ISO symbol, but it does show me that it is a breaker. And this 147, 1739, that's a part number for the breaker. Part number for the starter is right there. Okay, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and we're gonna go look at a few things here. Okay. 
some sensor pressure switch, I guess this is, sorry. We have this little bulb on the bottom that shows me that it's related to pressure. It could be pneumatic or hydraulic. It's showing me as a switch, so the green wire comes in to that bulb down to ground. So when there is engine oil pressure, it will, this will take me to the machine location, it will switch. So this right up here is a temperature switch. There's many ways to draw temperature switches. A solenoid, so they have a wire coming in through a coil of wire down and we can see the armature on the end. What else are we going to look at? Whoa, that's not what I wanted to do, sorry. Oh, our relays. So there's a relay, similar to a magnetic switch. Relays generally have, they'll switch from one to the other. So on a five pin relay, pin 87A is always in continuity with pin 30. And then when this little coil of wire gets powered, it creates a magnetic field, That'll pull this switch over to 87 and energize it. Four pin relays work exactly like a magnetic switch. Our connectors, there's an eight pin connector and it shows what wires going into which pin. This is the female connector side of the connector. That's a male side. Dots like this hooked together generally just a junction. The way Caterpillar does their schematics is all of these wires right here are running into this black bar and that just symbolizes it's going into a harness. The little blue line shows that's a harness and this is where the wires come out of the harness. So if I wanted to follow let's say this um, wire right here P984 it's a yellow 18 gauge I come up, it's into this harness, goes through here, and then I just gotta find the same wire, P98, yellow 18 gauge. There it is right there. And it goes back into the harness right here. Comes out right there again and goes to pin F of that connector. So, different manufacturers will have different ways of doing it. It's Caterpillar's way. <clears throat> I'm going to show you something different here. Let's go to the second schematic. So this is the last thing I wanted to show you when interpreting a schematic. I'm just going to zoom in on this little section here. Whenever I see this dotted line around something, that generally means it's an option or an auxiliary something or attachment something like that and we can see in here this little box in here is the heater group with that part number so we may have to look at the build sheet of our machine to know which option the machine comes with there could be many many of them there's a few different ways that we can do this um, I'm just gonna try this I'm gonna click on connector 20 takes me to the location of that connector. I'm going to click on this. Heater group attachment. Let's click on this other one. Okay, there is another attachment. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. And this one here is our air conditioner group. So that is our part number for our air conditioner group. Same four wires, same connector, all that fun stuff. So this, it looks like this machine Standard comes with an air conditioner, and if you just want a heater, it's actually an option. There may be others, not too sure. But anyways, it says these two connectors go to lower platform harness. So there's a few ways that we could get to that lower platform harness, and we could just search and try to find this connector 20. I'm not too sure how you want to do it, but since you're not here, we're going to do it my way. So I'm going to go back out. I'm going to go to the top of this schematic. We're going to just go and page down here a little bit. Oh, there's where I want. Nope, that's not it. OK, 
Connector, okay, volume one of two, engine and chassis. Connector 20, F10. I'm gonna click that, and there it takes me to my harness. Connector 20, my four pin connector, the wire's going to it. Of course, these just kind of go along and don't go anywhere. So that means, well, that's where our heater or our air conditioning wiring harness plugs into. So anytime you see the wires just end in a schematic, there usually is something on a different schematic that plugs into it. Well, I hope you found this informative, but I think that's about all I want to show you. So let's go do something else. So far, we've looked at the control circuit and how it works. We've looked at the starter motors solenoid and how it engages. The last thing we need to do is talk about how the starter actually disengages. And to do that, we need to talk about magnetic fields. And the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, how to measure the strength of a magnetic field. So it's pretty easy to do. All you got to do is measure the amount of amps that are flowing through the coil of our electromagnet and then we just multiply that amperage by the number of wraps in the coil. So one thing to know and remember is the hold-in winding and the pull-in winding in that solenoid coil have the exact same number of wraps. So looking at this picture here, we can see that the pull-in winding has a very heavy wire and the hold-in winding has a very light wire. So it's a much smaller wire. Both of them happen to be 100 ramps of wire in this example. If we send the same 12 volts through both coils, the pull-in winding is drawing 36 amps and the hold-in winding is drawing 12 amps. So if we want to figure out our ampere turns, we just take for the pull-in 36 amps times 100 wraps equals 3600 ampere turns. And we do the same thing on the bottom, 12 times 100, 1200 ampere turns. The biggest thing to get out of this is to remember that the pull-in and the hold-in winding have the exact same number of wraps. It's very important. So going off of this, we've seen this already before. A uh, few things we need to talk about here is again, this is going to get a little hillbilly and I apologize already. The hold in and the pull in, the pull in is a red, the hold in is a blue. They have the same number of wraps and they're wrapped in the same direction. So if we're say the wire comes in, it goes over and away, over and away. Both coils are wrapped the same way. So I've got the motor terminal is hooked to the motor of the starter motor. So the green piece in there, that is our contact disc. We have a push button for a starter, quite a simple system. So let's talk about how this thing works. So this is gonna get kind of hillbilly. Again, I, I apologize. This black piece we're looking at here with that spring, that is the contact disc for the motor. So there are no solenoid windings drawn in there. We're going to draw those right now. So I'm going to come off of here. We're going to come up. I'm just going to go like that. So, and let's say the coil is this way. And this one goes off the ground. So that is my hold in winding. Let's put another coil. exact same number of wraps and it hooks to the motor. So there's my pull-in winding. So let's go and close the switch. So I'm going to push down on the button and I'm going to close the switch. Now battery voltage flows down, flows through the switch and comes up into here and we have plus there. That flows through this coil of winding and goes to ground. So this side of course is negative. The power also flows through this second winding and flows around to the motor terminal 
and it goes through the motor windings which we know are very heavy they're basically really thick heavy copper so there's very very little resistance in the motor so this acts like it is a ground it's hooked directly to ground power is flowing through the coil in this direction as well as flowing through the coil in that direction so that's going to make this a south pole this a north pole this one here is going to be a north pole this one's going to be a south pole we said the hold in winding was I believe 1200 ampere turns. The pull in winding was I think 3600. Total 4800 ampere turns. Lots of magnetic force and the contact disc slams into the contacts. Okay, so now. Our module says we're only allowed a 0.2 of a voltage drop across the contacts. So if this here is 12 volts, the, the least amount of voltage we could have here is 11.8. So we're just going to say it's, it's a really good contact and it's 12 volts. So now I have 12 volts right here, which means I have 12 volts right there. I'm going to get rid of that little minus sign. So there's 12 volts right here. I still have the starter switch pushed because the engine is cranking. So that means there's 12 volts right here. So if there's 12 volts here and 12 volts here, there's no current flow through that coil. So if we have no current flow, we don't have a north or a south pole. So my pulling winding is now doing nothing. I still have the starter button pushed. There's still 12 volts here. There's still ground here. So my total ampere turns is 1200. And the motor is running. Now, this is where it gets kind of tricky. The engine starts. I Actually, I'm going to back it up one slide because it's in my way. I release the starter button. When I release the starter button, that's all I did was release the starter button. I now don't have any voltage going through this wire. But something crazy is happening here. These are in contact, which means I have 12 volts right here which we still have that 12 volts right there. There is no voltage coming through this way. So is it possible for this voltage to travel through that coil of wire, come up and travel through this coil of wire and make it to ground? You bet there is. So those two coils are now in series with each other. So what happens is the voltage travels through this way and it comes around and travels the same direction through those two arrows. So if these are in series, we're going to end up with a voltage drop over here and a voltage drop over here. So if I figure out or put an amp clamp on here, there might be, because they're in series, there's going to be less average, but let's say there is five amps able to go through there. If I go 5 times 100 and 5 times 100, that's 500 plus another 500, that's a 1,000 ampere turns. That's very close to this. That starter may stay engaged and run even with the engine running and the button off. But with the wire or with the current flowing this way, this is going to make this a north pole. This is going to be, I mean a south pole, this is going to be a north pole. So the current's flowing that way, goes around. This is still going to be a south pole. This is going to be a north pole. 5 times 100, 500 ampere turns. 5 times 100, 500 ampere turns. So that means we have the same magnetic force on both coils. South pole, north pole, north pole, south pole. They cancel each other out. And the spring pushes the contact discs away, releasing the starter. Now that happens very quickly. 
and, but it does happen. That is why these have to have the same amount of coils and wrapped in the same direction. Now let's talk about troubleshooting a little bit. It doesn't matter which coil we pick. Let's pick a coil. Well, I'll let you pick a coil. Good job. Let's pick the top one here. Let's short the top one. So what happened is our wraps, the wires, instead of wrapping around and around, the wires rub through and we have this happening. Starter button, I push it, power comes through, push the starter button, power comes through both of the coils, one goes to ground, one goes to the motor, creates a strong magnetic field. Because this is missing wraps, it's actually lowered its resistance. It may flow more than 10 amps, it, it's hard to tell. But anyways, we definitely have enough magnetic strength to engage this starter, and due to this lower resistance, it might flow 15 amps and have 50 wraps and be close to enough to hold the starter engaged. Motor starts spinning, starts spinning the engine, engine fires up, I release the button, the contact disc is supplying power back through this way. Let's say we have 10 amps flowing this way at 10 times a thousand, sorry 100, which would equal a thousand amp your turns. That same 10 amps flows through here, and let's say there's 50 wraps there, so 10 times 50 is 500. So this south pole, north pole, has got a thousand ampere turns. This opposite direction magnet has 500 ampere turns. So we're, we cancel out 500, but there's still 500 more here, which means if the, we, I can hold that magnetic field there, the starter stays engaged the motor runs while the engine is running, even with the starter button released. The starter remains engaged to the engine. It doesn't matter which coil we short. If we shorted this one and left that one good, it would do the exact same thing. The starter motor will run on. Okay, let's get rid of all these numbers and drawings. I think somebody's gonna be mad at me. So we're gonna redraw those coils of wire. Now, let's talk about some other troubleshooting stuff. What would happen, or what's gonna go on if my pull-in winding is open? So there's a break in my pull-in winding. What's going to happen to my starter when I hit the start button? You're right. In this scenario here, it's not going to do anything. We're going to push the button. There's going to be no sound. There's going to be no cranking. There's not going to be anything going on. If I push this button down, power flows up, gets to here, can't flow this way, it can only flow that way, and the hold-in winding probably doesn't have enough power to pull the armature and the solenoid into contact with the disc and engage the starter. So it creates a magnetic field, but nothing moves. If we had a magnetic switch or a relay or something in this line to control these two solenoids, we would hear that magnetic switch or relay clicking, sending power to it, but of course the starter motor wouldn't turn. So let's hook this back up. What would happen if the hold-in winding did not have continuity? So we have an open in the hold-in winding. What's gonna happen there? You're right, the starter is going to chatter. So when I push the button down, I send power in, power comes to here, cannot go through the hold-in, but it can go through the pull-in winding. The pull-in winding is strong enough to engage the starter. The contact disc comes over, engages. Now we have 
12 volts here traveling through to 12 volts there. That 12 volts is now here. There's still 12 volts because I'm holding the starter button. This coil of wire loses all magnetic force. And because there's no current flowing through this one, there is no magnetic force holding the armature in place and the spring pushes it back. As soon as the spring pushes it back, we break contact here. Now we don't have 12 volts on both sides. This side will drop to zero and the power will flow through the coil again, slamming it back into contact. So we will hear the starter engaging and disengaging very quickly and we call that chatter. The engine probably will not crank. It just chatters back and forth because the power isn't there long enough to get the engine to spin. So we've looked at starter won't engage, starter chattering, and starter keeps running on, all having to do with these two coils of wire. Well, I hope you found this informative. I had a lot of fun doing it. I'm going to try to get these drawings off of this screen before I get in too much trouble. And I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching.